I see this as a positive kind of cooperation between India and Burma. And even for this also, after this meeting, we don't just want to let it go. But I think we just have to take it forward and then, uh, you know, work together. And also, we, m we must listen to what the development that has taken pl is taking place in, the, in Burma. And at the same time, what India can do. And I think from now on, to, since there are lots of things taken, taking place at the government level, but also from uh, at the people level also, I think we need to build uh, better and closer relations. Yeah, thank you all. Thank you, Alana. Uh, allow me also on behalf of both the India International Center and the Society for Policy Studies to extend a very warm welcome to all of you. I think I know most of you, but I do want to specially welcome the community leaders and the NGO reps who are representing Myanmar over here. Most of you are resident in Delhi. I think some of you have come from Myanmar. So a very, very warm welcome to all of you. A brief word about the SPS, the Society for Policy Studies, and the current effort that we are engaged in with the India International Center. Again, as some of you may be aware, the Society for Policy Studies is a recently set up think tank here in Delhi. And it is looking at policy-related issues. And to the extent possible, we are trying to create what you might call as a conducive forum for discussing a wide range of issues. It is not confined only to economic trade or security or foreign policy or politics, but we are looking at as relevant a range of issues as possible. And the objective is, as I said, to create a forum a place where these issues could be discussed in a candid and objective and constructive way. That is the operative word. And to that extent, the India International Center has also been very supportive of this effort. And what we are doing today, we normally do these roundtable conferences, is part of the same effort. And I do want to thank BCD and Dr. Alana particularly for the cooperation that they have also extended in making this possible. Now, today's conference, before we start, and I welcome and introduce our main speaker, Secretary Pinak Chakravarti, I just thought that I would take a couple of minutes, A, to welcome some of our very senior and distinguished guests. Many of you around here are experienced people who have dealt with Myanmar, India, Myanmar. But I do want to particularly welcome our members of parliament from Myanmar who are with us today the media representatives who are here, and the other community leaders. Allow me to also acknowledge Ambassador Malik, Preet Malik. He's one of our senior ambassadors from India to Myanmar. And I recall that over the years, when we look at the nature of the relationship, he had played a very important role, and he will be with us most of the day today. We have some of our own members of parliament here. I thought I saw Mr. Tarun Vijay. He stepped out. He's a member of the BJP's national executive. He's also here with us for some part of the day. We will have a couple of others. I also want to acknowledge here the representation of the CII, Mr. Ravi Bhotalingam. He's here. He's a member of the CII. Fiki, I'm not sure if they're already here, but they will be joining us. The idea being that we wanted to get trade and commerce reps. We also have very distinguished academics. I want to rec recognize my friend Baladas Goshal. He's a very senior professor from JNU. He'll be speaking to us in the next session. But I just thought I would give you all a broad overview to say that this is the beginning of really an effort to sustain the dialogue between India and Myanmar amongst experts. And we are delighted that all of you are here. Now allow me to take just a minute to welcome and introduce in our midst Secretary Pinak Chakravarti. His CV has already been circulated, so I did not want to take too much time, but just to thank him very much for being with us this morning. Those of you who know Delhi and its, shall we say, pressures as far as senior officials are concerned, a secretary in the NEA, you know, his day is slivered by the minute. So when we made this request to him saying that we have this effort and would he be kind enough to share his thoughts, he agreed despite various other commitments. I personally have known Secretary Pinak Chakravarti for many years. He's a very distinguished senior member of the Indian Foreign Service. His own experience in the region has again been very, very, I would say, distinctive. He was our High Commissioner in Bangladesh. He's been our ambassador in Thailand, and there are various other activities that he's done. He's currently Secretary of the Ministry looking after economic relations, ER as it is called. So with that, allow me to thank you again, Pinak, and request you to share your thoughts. Thank you. Thank you, Uday. Uh, 
honorable members of parliament from Myanmar and India and uh, Ambassador Malik, uh, my senior colleague in the service, now retired, which I shall soon be in a few months' time, <laughs> and join the fraternity. Uh, Uday mentioned that I was uh, High Commissioner in Bangladesh and Ambassador in Thailand. And so I've seen the Myanmar's border from these two ends. And, uh, but I've also visited uh, Myanmar as chief of protocol when I accompanied uh, uh, our former president, Dr. Kalam, on, I think, one of the, uh, on a state visit to Myanmar. But this was before the onset of the political transition that uh, started sometime in 2011, which, of course, has now led to an ex I mean, it would be not wrong to use the word uh, explosion in the kind of interface uh, uh, that we have now developed with, uh, with, as you said, the changing Myanmar. Now, uh, let me um, highlight briefly what, what are the changes that uh, we have uh, been following up with Myanmar in our relations, in our bilateral relations mainly. And, uh, and uh, what are the areas that we have been actually cooperating and how we are trying to manage the relationship, the changing relationship and the changing, with the changing, you know, with the changes that are taking place in Myanmar. Now, uh, I don't want to run over the usual geography, etc. We all know Myanmar is, uh, you know, shares borders with us in Arunachal Pradesh, Nagaland, Manipur and Mizoram. And uh, it is the only ASEAN country with which we have a border. And, uh, and, uh, and we, given the, the geographical sort of, you know, uh, the region as such where it is located, uh, it would be not wrong to assume that we, 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 we have strategic interests uh, in Myanmar. Uh, we also have a maritime boundary with Myanmar in the Bay of Bengal. So let me begin with uh, with some of the security and other other areas that uh, we have now developed a, a very good uh, sort of mechanism and dialogue with the Myanmar's government. I mean, both sides uh, are, of course, worried by the cross-border movements. We have a porous border, basically. And uh, but before I get into that, let me also mention a little bit about how we are trying to um, use. Uh, the public diplomacy arm of the ministry uh, to engage with uh, various constituencies in Myanmar. And not just, uh, you know, having a seminar here in Delhi, but we've done, uh, you know, conferences and seminars, uh, particularly focusing on the northeastern states. And we've done it in Aizwal, we've done it in Manipur, Kolkata, of course, we've had, and uh, Guwahati, and uh, so um, in Nagaland also we had so we, we've involved the state governments in, uh, in, in these kind of efforts, particularly, and with Myanmar's, uh, you know, uh, guests and others coming over to these states uh, to, to join our scholars and, and, and politicians, diplomats to sit and discuss various issues. So with that background, let me just uh, talk, about, talk a little about the security interests where uh, we all, we share interests, you know, on cross-border problems undesirable activities of uh, insurgents, armed smugglers, drug traffickers, and um, activities of Indian insurgent groups, etc. Now, what has happened is that, um, that uh, Myanmar has been uh, uh, quite forthcoming and sensitive to all these concerns, and we've developed, uh, you know, linkages with, the, with their uh, army and intelligence and other uh, agencies. And also they have created a special force to deal with some of these issues. Uh, I think it's called Lavaka, the, that special force. And uh, so there is a good deal of progress on these issues. And the cooperation is really now yielding fruits on many of these uh, insurgent uh, and other camps that were located. Now, uh, the other main, uh, you know, because of our land boundary and uh, the fact that uh, Myanmar is the only ASEAN country, 
So one of the things that we've been pursuing is connectivity, which is, uh, you know, the trilateral highway project involving India, Myanmar, and Thailand. So this is a, shall we say, still work in progress because uh, on the Thai side, the linkages are there. On our side, some of it needs to be built. Um, on the In Myanmar, we need to again build uh, some more you know, linkages, etc. The, and the other main connectivity project is the Reethiddim uh, road project and the Kaladan multimodal trans transit transport project, which actually helps to give uh, our northeast access to a port, which is Sitwe. Uh, both Bangladesh, uh, we are pursuing with both Bangladesh and Myanmar the connectivity proposals because the northeast uh, has uh, ha can access connectivity through Bangladesh as well and through this through this Kaladan project. The other main area of our interest, our mutual interest, uh, uh, is the field of energy security, which is uh, very important for us. India is a major importer uh, of uh, fossil fuels and uh, oil and gas, basically. And uh, as we, as the economy grows, I think about 80 percent of our of our fossil fuel will be imported in the future. And uh, so we, we in the hydrocarbon sector, we are quite active, and uh, in the exploration and extraction areas as well. Uh, ONGC Videsh and Gale have also acquired stakes, 20% and 10% respectively, in certain blocks um, of the coast uh, uh, of uh, in the southern part. Messrs. SR has acquired stakes in offshore blocks. Uh, then Jubilant Oil and Gas was awarded an onshore contract. Uh, seven Indian companies are part of the 59 international companies shortlisted by the Myanmar government for submission of final bids on many of these oil blocks. And uh, expressions of interest have been invited from many other countries. And uh, we are encouraging uh, from the government the Indian companies to participate in the bidding of these on these offshore blocks. Uh, I've already mentioned the Kaladan project and how it will help our uh, connectivity to the northeast. And uh, the next area I would uh, outline is uh, of food security, uh, which is that um, in uh, Myanmar is today the largest supplier of uh, pulses and moong dal, I mean moong beans, I think. And Myanmar has a huge potential uh, in terms of growing uh, food, and India is a big market. So in this area, we have uh, we have tried to encourage uh, uh, investments, particularly if possible, by which also including to the garments and the leather sectors, because uh, Myanmar does enjoy GSP benefits uh, extended uh, to it by USA and e and the EU. Now, there is also potential for, uh, for getting into palm oil and rubber uh, plantations, which are also in big demand in the Indian market. Uh, during his visit to Myanmar, our Commerce Minister and Industry Minister offered about $150 million Exim Bank line of credit for the development of a, uh, of a special economic zone uh, in Sitwe. And in industrial zone in the Sagaing division. Uh, as a follow-up, textile delegations have visited uh, to assess the cooperation and uh, how, to, how to perhaps revive some of the sick industries and also to, to, to give training and do some capacity building. Now, uh, these are some of the areas that we are deeply engaged now, but there are, of course, uh, you know, we have also had to develop institutional mechanisms to deal with many of these areas, agriculture, trade and commerce, science and technology, training. So we have, of course, the foreign office consultations, the broad, the apex body. Then we have regional border committees. Then we have joint working group on railways and shipping uh, to do for connectivity issues, joint working group on agriculture, the Joint Trade Committee, the Border Trade Committee, because we also have border trade with Myanmar, and science and technology, and various other committees that look into the areas. Uh, 
one of the major things that have happened after the onset of the or the transition in Myanmar is the is of course the the uh, high level visits and uh, lots of them have taken place and i think the the last one was by uh, the high le highest high level was prime minister uh, from uh, in may 2012 and this was the first visit of an indian prime minister after a gap of almost 25 years uh, we signed a lot of agreements. Um, there was a 500 million line of credit, air services agreement, then we, we are going to set up an advanced center for agricultural research and education, the rice biopark, and info information technology institute, border area development uh, programs, cultural exchange program, academic exchanges between universities and think tanks, and of course as part of the human resource development programs and capacity building training slots for Myanmarese nationals in India have been raised to 500 per annum and uh, there is also of course a program for training of uh, parliamentarians in parliamentary procedures and uh, that kind of thing. Uh, other ministers have gone and even the defense minister has visited uh, in January of this year the external affairs minister went there and uh, I th you know, for this Buddhist conference where we have provided uh, funding for the repairs and maintenance of the, Shwe, the iconic Shwedagan Pagoda and also we've given the replica of the Sarnath Buddha uh, which is now established there. Uh, on the economic and trade uh, front, uh, trade is of course um, still not up to up to what our expectation but it will take time um, I think trade, trade is about 1.95 billion both ways with about India selling about 550 million and the rest uh, we are importing in other words Myanmar enjoys in a, a favorable balance of trade with India uh, much of our trade with Myanmar is dominated by timber you know uh, I think almost a fifth uh, is dominated by timber and I have mentioned beans and pulses etc and uh, India's exports of course uh, though small but um, very diverse you know pharmaceutical products steel and iron products electrical machinery mineral oil rubber and articles plastics in fact pharmaceutical uh, pharma the sector is a very large uh, you know sector in Myanmar I think Indian pharmaceutical companies, I think over 13 of them are active and selling uh, products there. Um, traditionally with many of these countries we've had border trade, including with Bangladesh we've had. And so, but border trade was usually based on head load basis that uh, people carried something on their heads in a basket and exchange goods at the border. And uh, we have now at More Tamu point in the, Mian, in the Manipur sector. Uh, this was oper operationalized in April 95. A second one in 2004 at the Zaukatar Ri. And the third point has been proposed. And we of course, we need to upgrade the infrastructure for all this. And, uh, uh, and the tr there is a list of items that can be traded, which has now gone up from about 18 to 62. Um, also, the other concept is that of a border heart. Again, this is a common thing with Bangladesh and Myanmar where people are allowed to come in, a, in an area, a restricted area, uh, along the border somewhere at a predetermined place which is, and then they can exchange goods there. Border trade is now estimated to be around um, roughly uh, 35, 36 million dollars uh, per annum. Invest on the investments, India is today the largest, one of the largest investors. In fact, it's the tenth largest investor in Myanmar. Uh, both private and public sector companies from India have invested to the tune of about uh, uh, 280 million. Uh, but much of it now is now in the oil and gas sector, uh, manufacturing sector also. But again, upstream oil and gas, uh, gas products. Uh, engineering, procurement, fabrication, installation, etc. Uh, the Larson and Tubro, one of our largest, uh, you know, companies, has won a contract for three offshore wellhead platforms 
pipelines, etc. Punj Lloyd is also there executing a fairly large project of two parallel pipelines for gas and oil. There are many others. I don't want to mention all of them, but quite a few are there. And we have put in place the bilateral investment uh, promotion agreement, BIPA, as we call it, and also the double taxation avoidance agreement. And uh, the United Bank of India has signed three banking agreements with banks of Myanmar, MFTB, MICB, and MEB. These are the three uh, Myanmarese banks. The, I've mentioned the hydrocarbon sector and, and the, what the ONGC Videsh and Gale have acquired uh, sort of uh, stakes in many of these blocks. And we are also offering a line of credit of about 20 million for uh, revamping the Tanlin refinery in, uh, in Myanmar. I think this project is being executed by a company called Novatech. Um, concessional credits for development cooperation uh, amounts to almost now half a billion. And uh, mainly these are, these are going into irrigation project, railways, uh, but also there are some grants in it of, of about another 470 odd million in various projects. Um, the projects can be seen, you know, they are listed uh, in the website also. The other uh, main area of engagement has been uh, capacity building and human resource development. So under the ITEC program, the TCS and the ICCR scholarships, we've, uh, we've had many, many uh, students and trainees coming from Myanmar to India over the years. <coughs> then we've, uh, and one of the things that we established is the India Myanmar Center for Enhancement of IT Skills in Yangon. Uh, this was a, this was set up in 2008. Over uh, over a thousand students have so far been trained, and it's now being upgraded also so that we can we we can train more people, and. Uh, so on the ITC, um, the ITC, there is an ITC, the, what do you call this, uh, the industrial training center is being set up uh, at the request of the Myanmarese government. And uh, then, of course, the academic and other programs that uh, we have been uh, pursuing. Now, I'll come back to the, to some of the security uh, mechanisms that we have to discuss security issues. And um, we have a home secretary level meeting. Uh, we have joint secretary level meetings. We have nodal points on inten intelligence sharing. And uh, we have regional border committees, uh, including at the army commanders and others level, core commanders level. And then there is an MOU on border area development. And, and, and quite a lot of money has been uh, released for these kind of activities, particularly the border area development. Uh, we do have some uh, remaining uh, boundary issues where uh, there are problems of, uh, you know, identifying where construction can be done or cannot be done. We have some agreements that you cannot construct uh, things, uh, you know, within, say, a few meters of the border. So some of uh, those constructions are, have been disputed, and we're trying to work that out with the, with the Myanmar East side. And uh, we have, in fact, recommended some of these... Uh, structures should be removed from the border on our side where uh, where we feel they have not followed the guidelines uh, properly. Cultural uh, cooperation, people-to-people -people contacts is of course uh, fostered by the fact that we share a, a deep sense of uh, kinship with uh, the Myanmarese people, um, particularly uh, through uh, the, re the religious connect and uh, apart from the fact that uh, uh, we've had a long history of association even under the British period. Now, I mentioned the International Buddhist Cultural uh, Heritage Conference that was held in December 2012. Uh, the other area that we have uh, engaged very, very closely is humanitarian and disaster relief because um, I think Myanmar was hit very badly by a couple of cyclones and uh, uh, there was a lot of damage including to transformers. So India actually re repaired and or replaced about 16 damaged uh, transformers and uh, also provided funding for uh, about a million dollars for relief and reconstruction um, and then about um, some cash grants to various uh, uh, 
uh, schools and primary schools. <coughs> then um, other other areas where which has been recently hit by some violence, uh, the government of India has provided uh, relief uh, uh, relief material and helped in trying to re you know construct schools, etc. Um, Globally, Myanmar, of course, uh, as a, in, in regional uh, organizations, we are members of ASEAN, BIMSTEC, and the Mekong Ganga Cooperation, which has national and sub-regional dimension to our bilateral relationship and 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 part overall part of uh, of our Look East policy. And uh, we we have extended to Myanmar the the the, the, the visa on arrival facility. Uh, and with that, we now provide to seven ASEAN countries visa on arrival facilities. We cooperate in the in the UN and other places. Um, and uh, Myanmar has observer status at SARC, and uh, we uh, we we have fair amount of cooperation in the in the in the international fora as well. Now, I think I have actually covered some of the main areas that we are now. Uh, deeply engaged and uh, uh, there are many, many other things that can be said on each and every issue, but I think that is really the uh, really part of the next uh, phase of this conference where you can con you are concentrating on a particular area. So I think with those uh, with, with that I think I'll come to an end here <coughs> and thank you again for inviting me. I'll thank uh, Secretary Pinat Chakravarti for sharing his thoughts with us, with us. We still have a little time, so what I'm going to do is, with your permission, I'll request Ambassador Malik, who's had a long innings, as I said, in Myanmar as the Indian ambassador, and subsequently he has been looking at various aspects of the bilateral and the region to share a few of his thoughts. And we'll also have the benefit of his wisdom post-lunch also. Please, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Chakravarti has given us a lot of material to focus our attention on. Most of this uh, is indicative of trying to meet the challenges that the new dynamic uh, that Myanmar is today poses, particularly to countries like India who have uh, a very important uh, an old relationship uh, with that great country. Uh, I will just touch on two or three points which uh, I think need to be uh, highlighted, um, which have been referred to uh, in, a, in a broad based term by uh, Mr. Chakravarti. Uh, I start with the border development area program, which I feel is an extremely important uh, link if we take all the factors into account. It deals with the security issue because if there is a development on both sides, uh, the northeastern parts of India and the adjoining areas of Myanmar, where all the institutional relationships could be converted into a new dynamic of an economic relationship. And this is where you also deal with a people-to-people -people relationship because you're dealing with issues on the ground, agriculture, um, uh, social areas of uh, development. These are extremely important and they also would help bring greater stability to the areas on both sides. Uh, the second point which I think is extremely important is that the developmental issues which have become of common importance to India and Myanmar, where India is offering a fair amount of technological and material support. Uh, we have to break the, the present sort of linkage which puts a lot of emphasis on public sector involvement, which has led to delays in the past, which have also led to certain development programs which I think are of supreme importance being delayed. So this uh, is another aspect which I'm just detailing out, that instead of just confining ourselves to the public sector on important infrastructure development projects, we should also, where it is 
um, possible and we have the necessary um, research and other uh, facilities within the private sector to make joint use of those. And here I would refer in particular to the projects relating to the dams, both on the power and irrigation side, which have been put or placed on hold for the time being. The third aspect which has not been touched upon, but which I presume will come into the next session, is the political aspect. Now, let me put it this way. We are extremely happy that there is a transitory phase which may ultimately develop into a full-fledged democratic Myanmar. It is not uh, something that uh, can be commented on in any great detail as, as of today, but there is one major stumbling block which has to be attended to and dealt with as far as the transitory phase is concerned, and that is the present areas of the Constitution of 2008, which comes in the way of a full-fledged democratic uh, entity. And, this, uh, and uh, the other aspect of the political relationship is the problems that still persist where the ethnic minorities in Myanmar are concerned because these are areas where in, in certain cases they border on India's security too and they need to be uh, dealt with in such a manner that the cooperation ultimately evolves into a lot of stability on both sides of the border. We have problems on our side and Myanmar has problems on the, um, for instance, the Kachin um, ethnic issues are still unresolved. So these are the few areas that I thought would be of uh, value, that it's not just the economic relationship, it's not just the political relationship, it's the composite of the relationship. And I think significantly the relations that are taking place between Myanmar and Northeast India play a ma uh, 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 should play a major role, particularly as there is now also the involvement of ASEAN, where the Northeast states of India are concerned. So there is, uh, let us say, this is the composite which b would give further substance to India's look east policy. Uh, Myanmar is an extremely important element in that look east policy, and it is also part of the entire relationship that India is trying to develop with the whole of Southeast Asia and further on with East Asia. I'll close with that as of now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Pete, sir. Secretary Chakravarti has to leave us in a little while and, you know, he may not be able to stay for the next session. So I thought I would request our uh, honorable MPs from Myanmar if you, sir, would like to say a few words before the Secretary leaves, uh, Mr. Tinsue or Dr. Among. If you would like to, sir, please. Thank you very much for giving a chance to talk before you leave. So, um, uh, Your Excellency, just you explain about our relationship of India government and our Myanmar government, I think. So, uh, we have some clear cut about our relationship. Uh, uh, by telling us uh, today. Uh, we are very interesting about our uh, concerning about our projects in Myanmar in the present day. Uh, we have uh, a very crucial and we have uh, very big issue and very extreme issue working together with uh, China projects as we all know and we have a very uh, deep hearted insight about we don't want to be uh, seeing another projects like China you know so that I would like to uh, tell uh, we have to be careful 
for our India projects. So working together with Myanmar government. So I don't want to be the uh, India companies, the second China's company. That is very important point I bring today. So uh, whenever we are working together, so uh, we have to think the both sides benefits. So especially uh, we have very clear cut policy uh, uh, upon the especially like mega projects with international. So first is our government, the Myanmar government's policy has to be successful. Secondly, the international company has to be get uh, benefit. And the third point is uh, very important is uh, we have to uh, take care of the community's purpose. So that three point is very important for us. And uh, last year in this time, I myself have traveling uh, 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 along the Kaladan River by boat and seven days. And I made very, I, I, I can, I could see uh, the, the real situation in Kaladan projects. So that we have some more doubt about working together with, you know, uh, the India companies and up to now, even we don't clear that which kind of company, the, the India company working together with, you know, in this project from Burma side, from Myanmar side. So up to now, we don't have uh, transparency for that kind of uh, very huge project. And this is uh, uh, another important point. Even as a political party leader, I have to know at least. But my people, they are more they they, 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 they they know nothing about that our projects. And uh, regarding for the border area situation, from our side is uh, we have uh, we don't have transparency at all. Like uh, Manipur and our uh, Chen Stay and Sakai Division's border, they becomes a lots of opium plantation. Uh, it's becoming four, five years ago. It's uh, since four years ago, five years ago, and it's it was grow more and more. And my people from Chen, Chen Hills, you know, especially, we suffer for that. And uh, I think that this is uh, they have uh, they have permit from our government side. Without this, they cannot do nothing, you know. So that the uh, Manipurian uh, border, uh, our brothers from Manipur people, they enter to our land and they make opium plantation freely. And we, as a party chairman, I raise too many voices to my government, but no response, no reply from my government. So it is very important that I think uh, government, government to Government to government, we have to deal this uh, very carefully about because we don't want to be a, a opium plant to our state, you know. That is not important thing. So, so maybe my colleagues, maybe they have another point, you know. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Briefly, the in front of, uh, in the presence of uh, Secretary. Uh, my discussion topic is on economy. It's, it's quite boring. So I, I rather like to be uh, political. 
I've been, uh, I've been in India for 23 years. Uh, honestly speaking, I am not happy with the Indian government's policy in Burma since 1980 or 89. I've been arguing, I've been appealing the government of India and the decision maker to be pra real pragmatic, which is beneficial to both people's Obama and not the regime of Obama. Uh, my objective continue to be the show. And uh, as my colleague from Chin State mentioned about the concern about Gardenham project in city and uh, the, the Indian, Indian people from Northeast coming to Burma. Not only those anti-India arms groups, aid groups, but also those poppy growers are real concern. The government of Burma is not, not dealing these things. So there's something wrong about that between the two countries' relations. So I I appeal through the Secretary to look into the th these people. As Obama is imagining so, so-called democracy, you know, the people's role is more important than those regime or the Honda and Nibiru or Rengo. So as far as I know, the people in Aragon State, my colleague, uh, member of parliament also, he knows about all the Aragon, that Kalara or Sitwe or that offshore uh, fields are taking place. As far as I know, the people around there in Afghanistan are not happy with those uh, walks. For example, those violence took place last year, last couple of years. And uh, Indian governments are doing under 144. 144 means no, nobody is allowed to out uh, after 9 p.m. But Indian governments are doing business there. Construction is taking place nearby the hospital where the violent victims are hospitalized. So what I mean is that the people there's concern is more than the Honda and Nibiru. So I urge Indian government to look into the plight of the poor Burmese people. Okay, that's all. Thank you very much. Dr. Sway, for those of you who are not aware, you know, for many years he's been the face and the voice of the NLD. And we have heard him, as I said, I recall distinctly in the early 90s. And I'm actually going back to the Rajiv Gandhi years when he was our Prime Minister. And we had a certain policy apropos, Burma, Myanmar. But what I will also do, I'll take the liberty, if I may, uh, as a security analyst, which has been my perspective, to perhaps make a few broad observations, and this really is to take benefit of the presence of our Secretary, Mr. Pinak Chakravarti, over here. Now, he has given us the overview about where the relationship is and where perhaps we could be looking ahead. Ambassador Malik has shared and flagged what he thinks are some of the priority areas that need to be identified. And I'm very grateful to both our representatives from Myanmar with great candor to share, I think, some of your concerns which I'm sure that Secretary Chakravarti will take back with him. But I want to flag this and take this forward more for the benefit of our younger colleagues who are here. Many of you are community leaders who represent various NGOs. And I am reminded of a visit that my first visit to Myanmar, if I may, just for anecdotally, if I may add, by the way, I'm from the east coast of India. And when I look back, I'm from Andhra. And when I think about the first references to Burma, as we knew it then. In our part of the world, we called it Rangam. I don't know how many of you can understand or speak Telugu as a language. But in the old days, Rangoon, on the east coast of India, was referred to as Rangapatna. And I'm talking about rhythms of a hundred years. And since Myanmar, Burma itself has this very rich riverine tradition, and if you look at the entire east coast of India, from Bengal to Odisha to Andhra to Tamil Nadu, there is what I would call as the constant refrain of Myanmar, Burma. It comes in different ways. It comes in folk songs. I'm sure you are familiar with that. It comes in relation to rice. You know, we are from a rice uh, eating, rice growing part of the peninsula. And the refrain of, as I said, A, the linkages, and it was only much later that I had occasion to visit. And there is what I would call as a need to, in a way, resurrect these connectivities, to burnish them and give them the flavor and the relevance of this century. And in that context, when Secretary Chakravarti made this observation that currently our bilateral trade is below $40 million. Now this, if you reflect upon it, is a very, very modest figure. 
given the fact that India itself is now an economy that is 1 trillion plus. And ASEAN collectively, Myanmar by itself has enormous potential. So I thought I would just draw attention to that and remind ourselves that there is an enormous amount of potential and many of the, shall we say, relevant areas have already been identified. Mr. Chakravarti spoke about the fact that today Myanmar is our largest supplier of pulses. And that to me, from whatever little bit I have seen of Myanmar and the potential, is really, I think, just a small percentage of what is possible. Now, those of you who are into hydro and are aware of the potential of hydroelectric and the larger energy, I think there is a very strong case to be made that India's two critical neighbors are Bangladesh and Myanmar. And it is for good reason that if you look at the MEA and the way in which it has structured its own organizational responsibilities, while ASEAN is dealt with in a different collective, Myanmar and Bangladesh are together under what is called as the BSM division. And to that extent, while some of the security issues have been flagged, I think across the board for us in India, this is a relationship that has to be, I think, looked at in its entirety. And this really is the beginning, and that is where I am grateful to BCD and all the other colleagues over here for enabling this because, I mean, as all of you are aware, there is a term here that we often use in Hindustani. It is called alap. If you are familiar with it, it means in music that before you pick up the equivalent of a substantial issue for engaging what is called as a rag, the preparatory stage is the alap. <laughs> well, I don't want to, but I, that is expunged for various reasons. But we are, as I said, currently in a preparatory stage, and I am really grateful to all of you. And I hope that our sessions after this would allow us to, I think, examine the different aspects and then see as to how we can sustain this. And I hope that the next time we meet, we are in a happy situation to say that from 40 million, A, on trade and economy, there has been a substantial progress. And two, I think on the comfort level, you know, whether we talk about OPM issues and the fact that this leads to undesirable activities or greater levels of candor in terms of the political dialogue, you know, between both New Delhi and Myanmar and our northeastern states, which all, I think, have their own specific issues that they would bring onto the table. So on that note, I want to thank Secretary Pinak Chakravarti for being with us this morning despite his very busy schedule and for sharing his thoughts. And just give us a few minutes. We'll turn around. And I'll request my colleague Rashmi. She will steer us in the next session. Thank you very much, Vinak. When we hear our speakers, it's going to be a very robust and constructive uh, discussion. My first speaker is uh, Professor Baladas Ghoshal, all of us know, those who keep an eye on this region, how important he is as a resource person and gives us new insights into what is happening. He's, as they say, a join in the South Asian Studies program in India. And uh, let's begin with him. May I please invite Professor Ghoshal? Thank you very much. If I were to ask to present a paper on Burma or Myanmar, as whatever way you want to call it, internal political developments, its own foreign policy and all that, maybe my presentation would have been a little different than what I'm going to do today. Since the India is linked to that presentation, India and the political transition in Myanmar, my presentation would be not as an academic who is studying Myanmar politics. I would rather speak more from my head rather than from my heart. I may believe in a lot of other things about what should be done in Myanmar, but I think one has to also think in terms of the reality of internal dynamics of a particular country and how foreign policies are conducted in today's world. So I would make three propositions. 
to highlight the point about the relationship between India's role in Myanmar's political transition. The first proposition is that there is no correlation between foreign policy of a country and the political system in that particular country. It need not be true that foreign policy in a democracy is more rational than in an authoritarian political system or in a dictatorship. Democracies also can be very irrational in terms of foreign policies. Alternationalism and a whole lot of other things can determine the actual conduct of foreign policy in a democracy. And sometimes even dictators can even you know, behave in a more rational manner in a, in, a, in a situation in terms of relationship between the two countries. Now take the example of, say, the internal political developments in Myanmar today, a lot of people try to explain, a lot of analysts try to explain that the developments have taken place in Myanmar, whatever the nature of the development, uh, what I call limited kind of liberalization or quasi-democracy that has taken place in Myanmar, is due to the pressure that was imposed from the outside world. I don't agree with that proposition. I think the internal dynamics of Myanmar political politics had led this regime to bring about the kind of reforms that they have initiated. And it is basically an internal dynamics. And the future of democracy in Myanmar would also be conditioned by the internal dynamics of that particular country, not by the foreign policy of India, or for that matter, the United States. I think this point is highlighted by Aung San Suu Kyi in United States when she went for the first time, where she categorically mentioned that, thank you for all the things that you have done for us, but I think in future the internal dynamics will really condition the nature of developments that are going to take place in that country. So that's an important point. And if you look at even you know, the kind of changes that have taken place in so-called democracy, say, for example, in Maldives, or for that matter, in, uh, 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 in Nepal, have not changed the nature of foreign policy in those countries. Foreign policy is essentially guided by the national interests or whatever way a particular regime or regime is a good, bad word sometimes, or the government, let us say, the government perceives its national interest to be. And even in the case of, say, United States, which talks about you know, promotion of democracy in other parts of the world, its policy or European countries' policy towards Myanmar changed, not because of their love for democracy, but because of a different national interest. I think they wanted to have a share of the economic prosperity that Burma might enjoy with the opening of that particular country. And that's why they have relaxed the sanctions vis-a-vis -vis Myanmar. The second important proposition that I want to make, now I think the reason why I said that there is no correlation between foreign policy and internal political developments is that essentially because of the fact that people in India or many other people, even many uh, you know, people who are in exile in India, might think that this transition that have taken place in Myanmar, you know, India might play an important role in that. I would say I don't think India can play any important... I mean, it can only nudge a regime or a government. It can pursue policies in a certain manner which might convince the government of the good intentions of India and they might change. But there is no guarantee that any action by India will help that regime to bring about any changes in that country. It is again conditioned by the internal dynamics of that particular country and how the regime sees whether it is threatened by any forces or not. The second proposition 
is that the relationship between ethnic groups in any particular country, or for that matter, the relationship between the center and the periphery. I mean, what I said, the center means the dominant majority, and the periphery is the other ethnic groups. In political science language, we can sort of talk about center-periphery relationship. Again, are conditioned by the internal dynamics of a particular country. No other country can really influence that development. One can, of course, sometimes through examples in terms of, say, for example, India's example of any relationship between the center and the periphery might be taken by another country as one way to resolve some of the contradictions that exist in those societies. But it is, there is no guarantee that this could be one of the ways that a country can influence the political development or the kind of discourses that takes place in that country. Now, again, the reason why I'm talking about is this, you know, there's a lot of writing that I notice in India about the fact that, you know, Burma is now wrecked by, you know, this ethnic conflicts. And sometimes, you know, they try to blame that, you know, one particular group is inflicting kind of a, uh, a pain on the other kinds of groups. And again, kind of religious conflicts that are taking place in Myanmar or the central government's attitude towards the ethnic questions and all that, India could sort of influence the Myanmar regime in some way or the other. Again, I would like to argue that this is again conditioned by the internal dynamics of a particular country. No country would like to cede its authority, whether it's a democracy or a dictatorship cede its authority to another country to guide them how those relations should be uh, 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 structured. I mean, even in the case of India, as we talk about, you know, our you know, relationship with Kashmir, we don't want any third party to intervene. And in fact, you know, the United States have been trying its best to intervene in the case of Kashmir issue from time to time. And they're trying to suggest what we should do in our relationship with Pakistan and all that. But we don't want a third party to come into that. Similarly, in the case of Myanmar also, I would argue that Myanmar would not like, or even if India tries to sort of, you know, uh, uh, you know give any advice to the Myanmarese government on this issue, I don't think Myanmar is going to take it. It will be conditioned by Myanmar's own perception of the relationship between various ethnic communities or what I call the threat perception vis-a-vis -vis each other. I think the long years of you know, civil war in Myanmar and before that the colonial policy and practice, you know, using one community against the other, one religious groups against the other, plus the kind of you know, uh, 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 civil war that have wrecked Myanmar for more than 50 years, are going to condition the perception of the government vis-a-vis -vis other communities. But this is not something going to be static to my mind. I always look at history to see whether how things shape in a particular country. Take the example of Indonesia. Federalism was a taboo in Indonesia immediately after independence. And in fact, when the Dutch left Indonesia with a federal constitution, the first important step the government took when they became independent was to scrap federation and then introduce a unitary form of government. And for many years, Indonesia felt that a federalism might divide the country, might lead to cessation, and they refused to really give any kind of autonomy to any of their regions. It was a totally centralized form of government for many years. But interestingly today, Indonesia is the most decentralized country in the world. Most of the districts, the provinces enjoy autonomy. And the latest example of giving autonomy to Aceh, one of the regions which were, talking, which were fighting against, fighting for autonomy, and uh, uh, even talked about secession at one point of time. Now the government has given autonomy and now the relationship between the center and the periphery is much more stable compared to what it used to be. So 
even if people suggest any kind of measures right at this moment to resolve some of the contradictions that the center and the periphery are facing at the moment, I mean, towards the Kachins, towards the Rohingyas and all that, I don't think any advice will bring the regime to, I mean, to, to lead the regime to bring about any change. As situations change, as economic development takes place and more democratization takes place within the country, I think the regime or whatever government in power will automatically find it easier. Once the government feels confident, the center feels confident that the country will not be divided into various ethnic groups and between sort of you know, various uh, uh, nationalities and dismember the country, only then such changes can take place. I think one has to wait and see how things unfold. But the most important criteria of that unfolding of the process will depend on the kind of economic changes that take place. Because today, the economy, the cake, of the, the size of the cake is very small. And that's why the army wants to take complete sort of, you know, uh, uh, control over that cake. It is not prepared to share with others, like at one time in the case of Indonesian military, which had complete access to all the economic activities in the country. But again today, look at Indonesia. The army has withdrawn from many of the business enterprises. So economic development in Myanmar is one of the most important you know, uh, 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 thing that might bring about many changes, both in terms of democracy as well as in terms of the center-periphery relationship. Once the economy expands, things will take a different form. And once the economy expands with the opening of the country to integration process with other Southeast Asian countries, automatically we'll see certain transparency and accountability coming up in that. Now, the third proposition, again, in case of India, Secretary Chakravarti and others have spoken about Mung Dal. You know, dal is pulses are imported from uh, Myanmar. But do you know where, how does it come? It comes via Singapore. I had a talk last year when I was in uh, uh, Mandalay with the, the person who really controls the Mugdal, you know, trade. He told me that he finds it even cheaper to send Mugdal via Singapore than sending through the border. Because at the border post, at every areas, he has to bribe the people. So unless the security situation in that particular region is, you know, I mean, does improve, I don't think India has much chance to develop a very close relationship with that country, be it economic, political, or security. I mean, obviously security is interrelated in that. And connectivity. I mean, I, I, this, some of these issues will obviously be you know, elaborated by other speakers. Now, connectivity. Where is the connectivity? We talk about Kaladan project. We talk about this India-Myanmar, uh, Thailand project and all that. You know, drive between Manipur and the border looks like not you are traveling by car, but in a horseback. You know, it really trots uh, in a car. So until and unless, you know, some of these things are resolved, I don't think there is any opportunity for India to develop any closer relationship with Myanmar. And as opposed to that, look at China, border with Myanmar. Excellent connectivity, excellent arrangements for trade relationship, uh, Burmese trader can go into the Chinese border even without a paper, without a passport. Just you go around, stay there for two, three days, order your goods, the goods will be delivered, you can bring them back. So trade obviously flows between the two countries, whether you like it or not. But in the case of India, those things are not there. Talk about those beam stake, talk about Mekanganga cooperation, all those things are meaningless because not much has really progressed. And time is very important in today's world. Unless India seizes the opportunity, you know, India cannot really do much. 
links. You know, to go to Myanmar, which is just a few hundred kilometers from Calcutta or, or any other cities, many other cities, you have to go via Bangkok. You have to go via Bangkok. At one time, there were shipping links between Calcutta and Rangoon. And that used to be a lot of, I mean, Commodore Uday Bhaskar has spoken about the linkages at one point of time. And Rangoon and all these places were considered in the minds of many Indians as one of the Indian cities at one time because of the links and all that kind of thing that had happened. Now, all those things have snapped. There used to be a flight, direct flight from Calcutta to Yangon. Now, that also, I think, travels only once or twice a week. Now, all this Buddhist trade and all that kind of thing, because that's one of the major links with Myanmar. You know, how can it happen without any linkages, without any, uh, uh, you know, uh, air traffic between the two countries or sea traffic between the two countries. The last point is, you know, India's comparative advantage in this region is not in hard power, but in soft power. And Indian diplomacy has not learned how to use that soft power in any of these countries. We have an ICCR working. It is a bureaucratic institution. People are sent on the basis of that one person should have a one foreign posting. The person who is posted as the director of the center there, he may have worked as a PA to one of the officers at one time, and he's now become the you know, director of a cultural center. He has no idea how culture uh, means. He thinks about dance, uh, uh, you know, music and song are only culture. Culture is much broad-based, the diversity and the kind of sort of, you know, people to people, I mean, the lifestyle that people lead, these are things which need to be, you know, worked out. There was a time, at one point of time in Mandalay, there was a big center of a cultural organization operating from India. That office exists today, somebody showed it to me, but it is non-existent for more than 30 years in that. So I think India's soft power is the one that can really bring about a major, you know, qualitative change in the case of Myanmar, and that might help India to relate to the regime much better than through many other issues that many others have spoken about, creating suspicions, creating doubts about another China and all that. Thank you very much. Thank you. You know, I'll also go for that lecture. Okay. I'll come back. So if you want to ask any question within this 10 minutes, I may answer or I'll come back, say, uh, in the afternoon session and then I might take up this, whichever way you like. Should we keep it for after? Okay, the afternoon time? session. Thank you. Only one point about the flight to Myanmar. After the World Economic Forum, the industry minister down and we have got the freedom rights and Spice Jet has already applied for a license to fly from Delhi to Yangu via Dhaka. I mean, most probably it's in the next six months. Wait for 10 years. <laughs> Thank you, Professor. I'm sure uh, we can do um, many more questions uh, uh, to the Professor, and um, he'll field them after uh, this. Can I now please request uh, the next speaker, uh, Dr. Imong, uh, to, you know, uh, an interesting thing about uh, Dr. Mong, which is obviously in our folder also, is that he is a, um, a member of parliament from this party, which is the Rakhai party, which won with the majority in the two uh, zero ten elections, but for circumstances which we are all familiar with, um, he was not able to form the government in his uh, state. And we were talking about it, and he says, but he has hope and things may change. So let's hear him now. Thank you. Just one request. I know everybody has so much to say, and we are all eager to listen to all that you have, but we do have a time constraint. So, thank you. So, uh, distinguished guests, so, so, I would like to thank you, uh, all the attendants and uh, Burma Center, Delhi, and 
Society for Policy uh, Studies of uh, India. Uh, I would like to express my gratitude to all the participants. Uh, some are members of Parliament from uh, Myanmar. And I, I would like to change my topics because, uh, because it was depends on the uh, 2014 uh, chairs of ASEAN positions of my presidents and uh, uh, 2015 election perspectives. So I would like to change my newly parliament formations and functions of my parliament and how to uh, form uh, a process of uh, uh, committee and how to uh, produce a bill of Bill as a as a law in, in our parliament. So, the essence and fundamental uh, political change and reforms of uh, our country lines with the constitutions. Uh, in Myanmar, there has been three uh, constitutions so far. One is. Uh, 1947 uh, constituents of Union of Burma and then the, the constituents of the Social Republic of the Union of Myanmar in 1974 and the last constitution 2008 uh, it was promulgated in uh, to 29 November in 2008 and so now we have to discuss 2008 uh, constitution, uh, how to amend, how to review. Uh, this is the kind of uh, phasing in our uh, country and in our parliament. So I would like to uh, discuss you uh, about the uh, uh, formations of uh, parliament. Uh, my parliament is a, a bicameral parliament. So it is composed of uh, a lower house, namely Tidulotto, uh, and upper house, namely uh, nationalities, house of nationalities, and from house of nationalities. And uh, according to our constitution, the speaker and deputy speaker of Amudalotto shall serve as the speaker and deputy speaker of uh, first uh, 30 months for our uh, first terms of parliament. And then the, the next 30 months, the speaker of, and deputy speaker of, of Pidul Soto will serve another next uh, terms of uh, uh, union parliament, speaker and deputy speaker. And then the, so far, uh, we have uh, already done uh, seven sections of or regular sections of or union parliament and special sessions of uh, our union parliament was held from 20 uh, May to 21st May 2013 and uh, we are going to have uh, eight sections of uh, our first parliament will be held uh, coming 1st October uh, until up to two months I think that so after that, I would like to explain the uh, compositions of uh, uh, law house. The law house, we call that the Pidu uh, We have 440 representatives and 330 seats were elected by the uh, 330 townships of the whole of Myanmar. And there is one elected representative from each township. The remaining 110 representatives are defense uh, military personnel. So it is nominated by the uh, commander in chief of service in accord with the law. And also, a new Delta to also form with a total number of 224 representatives. Uh, out of 168 representatives, are elected in the uh, 12 representatives from each uh, 
uh, region and states. And our country is composed of seven states and seven regions. Out of total 224 representatives, 56 representatives are nominated by the uh, military personnel uh, who are nominated by the uh, chief of defense. So we have to think about for the uh, amendments and the reviews of uh, 2008 uh, constitution, how to reduce the uh, military personnel from the constitution now uh, seated area. So how to reduce the uh, personage of, personage of uh, military person in our parliament. This is the main problem. And then the uh, another uh, uh, parliament is called you know, regional and, and divisional parliament. So it was also found that uh, uh, as a, a part of uh, part of federalism, so uh, two representatives are elected from the uh, each township. So the uh, representatives of the uh, regional and state parliament also form as a uh, regional and state parliament in our uh, 14 state and uh, uh, division parliament. So the number of uh, representatives varies from the uh, number of uh, townships. So the uh, regional or, or this divisional parliament also form as a, a one third of representatives are nominated by the uh, military personnel. So you see uh, regional and a state level parliament and a union level parliament also uh, consists of uh, one third of representatives are uh, nominated by the military personnel. So are very crucial and we're thinking about that after the amendments of our constitution. So the, I would like to explain uh, uh, a union parliament of how to uh, uh, compose of union parliament. A union parliament is called Piram Zukloto. It is the highest law making organ of the state. In addition to Passing law in Giran Zutlato is formally uh, responsible for selecting the president and two uh, deputy vice presidents of the state. The Giran Zutlato is the combination of uh, Myodan Lato and uh, Pietul Lato. So the maximum of uh, Giran Zutlato uh, is 664 seats. Although the Giran Zu uh, Pidu definitely, definitely has the advantage of its numerical strength. The power and status of both Lutos are uh, coordinate and equal. So we have already formed, uh, according to the, our constitution, we have uh, four standing committee in each uh, parliament, lower house and upper house, and uh, additional uh, uh, 24 uh, committees are added in our uh, 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 law house and 21 uh, ad hoc committees are extended in our uh, upper house. So altogether, uh, so many additional ad committees in our two parliaments. So these committees are responsible not only f but to legislation, but also the tax of surveillance over administration. However, they didn't, they didn't consider a an, an matter of day-to-day -day administration of the consent ministry and the department. It is the uh, reciprocal control of uh, parliaments and administrative bodies of, according to our constitution. So uh, I would like to mention uh, as uh, legislations of our okay uh, legislations of our uh, 
parliament. The basic principle of the Republic of the Union of Myanmar is stipulated in Chapter 1 of the Constitution, comprising 48 uh, sections. Uh, regarding to the separations of power in Section 11A, the three branches of sovereign power, namely legislative power, executive power, and judicial power, are separated. Uh, to the extent possible, uh, an exact reciprocal control, check and balance, among themselves, it was the, it was prescribed in our constitution. So, the distributions of legislative powers of the union is chair among the Kidu Shweto and regional and state level Shweto. It's detailed in the Chichu number one. Uh, it was uh, uh, attached uh, by now uh, constitution. The Chichu one uh, enumerate metals on which. Pirang uh, Zukloto can exclusively uh, legislate, while Chichu 2, therefore, uh, specific matters on which regions or state legislation uh, alone can make laws. Chichu 3 is the list of legislations of leading body of self administ administers divisions of self administration uh, area. So, uh, well, I think that uh, the constitutions of uh, 2008. Uh, is uh, uh, I think uh, we need to uh, amend and uh, rebuke. So in our certain times, uh, th this is the uh, currently uh, facing so in our parliament. So um, after that, we have to discuss the uh, uh, coming uh, eight sections of my parliament. Uh, we have a review committee or reform there. So, um, I think uh, uh, very important parts of our uh, transition period will be uh, happen in our country. Uh, I think that Indian Myanmar relationship also very good. Uh, I think uh, very good in a situation uh, also. Uh, uh, I think the very good uh, the condition uh, will be uh, happening. So. Uh, my last uh, uh, suggestion is, so uh, I'm coming from uh, Rakhine State. So my people of Arkan is also uh, uh, very encourage uh, your uh, Kalatan River development project. Because of uh, our region is uh, a lack of uh, facility and lack of knowledge and lack of you know, development in our country. So we are willing uh, to uh, 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 set off a uh, willing uh, bridging uh, your uh, uh, Kalatan Rainbow project uh, to the uh, uh, to, to my developments of my area. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mon. Uh, our next speaker is also a member of Parliament, of the Indian Parliament, Mr. Tarun uh, Vijay. Though he doesn't, you know, have enough gray hairs, but he belongs to the House of Elders, as we say, the Rajya Sabha, you know. And more than that, he is actually also the founder member of the think tank of the BJP, which is um, uh, opposition party at the moment in uh, India, main opposition party. Besides that, he, of course, started as a journalist, so therefore I could take the liberty of talking about the color of his uh, hair. And um, he is also now at the moment doing something which is really taking up a lot of his time. He is the director of the India Inst uh, East Asia Research Foundation. And he is also on the Parliament's Consultative Committee on External Affairs. So um, I'm sure uh, my friends from Myanmar, as well as the audience here, would love to hear what Tarun Vijay has to tell us. Thank you, Tarun. I know you also write a column, and you know how to stick to the space which is given to you. I'm sure you <laughs> I, uh, We have about 10 minutes for you. Thank you. Respected friends and uh, colleagues, and uh, honorable uh, guests from Myanmar, I must uh, in the beginning, uh, uh, a 
extend warm greetings and uh, minglava. So when I was in Nepita, I was told that uh, normally when uh, Myanmarese meet, they don't say minglava, they say, where are you going? So I may repeat that sentence also that where both of us are going. <laughs> Suddenly I feel that the distances have grown. And perhaps we were more closer to each other in the last century than we are now. I had been uh, reading about Burma, Burmese society, Myanmar society uh, since my childhood. In the literature of Sharachandra Chandra Chattopadhyay, in the filmy songs, in movies, in 50s, my city is Dehradun in Uttarakhand. And uh, in 50, there is a very famous popular song which connected uh, Yangon with Dehradun. Mere piya gaye rangoon, mein baiti yahaan pe Dehradun. But that was the, you know, a popular general perception about a common Indian. And we felt that you are next door, another city. But now, uh, it's very far very far uh, and uh, I don't know why but uh, uh, we have been having a lot of uh, uh, cultural civilizational religious relations our king got buried in Rangoon and uh, King uh, Tibau in Ratnagiri but uh, hardly we know about it in Maharashtra also it was by the best of the well-read people, they hardly know anything about it. Even the bad news or good news hardly gets a space in Indian newspapers unless it's uh, rooted through the American channels about a certain leader through the American wire agencies. And we get to know about uh, uh, the dynamics uh, socio-political events and developments of Myanmar not through the Indian correspondence but through Reuters, AP, AFP. We hardly have any media presence uh, in uh, Myanmar. It's, it's nothing surprising seeing the present situation uh, in uh, India. The, I, I may use the word uh, sort of a colonial hangover that makes uh, London, New York, Washington much closer to Delhi and uh, our media, our people, our leaders in parliament, they are much more, uh, you know, knowledgeable about what bill is being introduced in the House of Commons than our youth development in uh, next door in Myanmar. So there was a private members bill introduced about the uh, Andaman tribes, Jarawa, it meant nothing. It had no value. It was just an introduction in British Parliament. But it made front page news in India and the Lieutenant Governor of Andaman created a new law, a new regulations for the tourists and for Indians going to Andamans in that city. It makes us feel very sad. And uh, I will just, uh, you know, read out another uh, kind of thing, which our parliament, how, how far are we aware of Pema? So on uh, last year, on 26th November, one of my friends from Arunachal Pradesh looks up and asked a question. Whether the government has signed any trade agreement with Myanmar during the last three years, if so, the details thereof. The new sectors identified in which trade relations are proposed to be expanded with the above, uh, country during the next three years, whether any targets has, have been fixed, details. That was the question asked by my colleague in Lok Sabha. And the answer is, number one, no. Number two, does not arise. Number three, no, madam. Number four, does not arise. 
This is this is Indian Parliament's minister's answers to the query raised by a very responsible Northeast member parliament from Northeast. So this is how we look to our neighbors and how important is this. I, I'll just go to a small thing. We have a 511 kilometer border in Mizoram, 400 kilometer in Manipur, 213 kilometer in Nagaland and 506 kilometer in Arunachal Pradesh. So what I want to say that perhaps the time has come now to again reinvigorate the relationship. I had driven from Kale to Imphal and uh, up to Kohima uh, just last year in uh, that ASEAN India car rally. The road was not very good but the no road was also not very bad that should deter us to stop going taking that road. Uh, I drove myself and uh, uh, my experience in Myanmar was wonderful. Very warm, affectionate people but uh, again the sad situation in Mandalay. Uh, the people there, the Buddhist community there, they tried their best to have a flight between uh, Yangon and Calcutta and they were trying to have a direct flight between Mandalay to Calcutta and Mandalay to Delhi. But surprisingly, or, or maybe because I am an Indian, I should not be surprised. Air India never flew. And they were giving a guarantee of full seats, full flights for the next six months. Not a single seat will be vacant and not a single flight uh, you know, will incur any losses. Give us the flights. I don't know why we never thought that there should be a direct flight between Manle, Kolkata, even Manle, Delhi, even Yangon, Delhi. So I gave all those uh, charter of demands and my observations to Minister of External Affairs and to the Prime Minister. I met Civil Aviation Minister that why can't we do it? The, the answers were simple here that, okay, we will try. I think it should have been done by now. But if it has not been done by now, we will try uh, very seriously in the future. So I will uh, just say that uh, it's one thing signing treaty of friendship and uh, uh, rights and, uh, you know, feeling very grateful to the government of Myanmar for helping us um, uh, control crime and control insurgency in our border. We are really very, very thankful to you. But uh, there is hardly any any activity. If we see that uh, our another uh, neighbor Chinese investment in Myanmar is to the tune of more than 35 percent, 32.8 percent, something like that. And if our figures are correct, our investment in Burma in Myanmar is uh, less than 1 percent, 0.65 percent or 0.7 percent, something like that. It tells a lot. So I I spoke in the parliament also that perhaps uh, uh, those who make uh, a bloody war with our country get the highest priority and uh, uh, greatest attention and all the confidence building measures are uh, uh, initiated with that country. But with those who are naturally friendly with us, obviously friendly with us, I think we must be making more uh, concerted efforts, number one, uh, parliamentary delegations exchanges. I hope that next time when honorable members of parliament from uh, Myanmar visit, we can welcome you in Indian parliament and more uh, parliamentarians from various political parties can uh, come and have a direct conversation and discussion with you. Number two, more media exchanges. I was a member of India-China I mean, Persons Group for two terms and uh, it took 10 years uh, to establish a India-China Media Forum uh, now, which we had been demanding for long. So there has to be a very strong media connection with Myanmar. We must be uh, 
monitoring, we must be, you know, publishing more about the uh, Myanmar life, literature, movies, uh, like that. One of uh, the famous uh, Myanmar actress was with us in the ASEAN car rally, and we could see that everyone was calling that she is uh, Ashwarya Rai of uh, <laughs> Myanmar. But here, uh, hardly anyone uh, published about it. So more about the socio-political things should be published. In, and uh, my another uh, suggestion is to uh, is a more emphasis on uh, youth exchanges. Perhaps your youth go more to Singapore, China, and USA, and our youth also go more to London, Europe, and maybe Malaysia. Uh, I, I simply can't understand it, that uh, why we don't go more to China, Japan, and uh, Myanmar. That should be should have been a, mo a more uh, uh, obvious thing. And more tourist, tourism. We can uh, propagate like Sri Lanka is uh, uh, publicizing uh, uh, tourist, uh, you know, Ramayana tourism in Sri Lanka, or whatever reason. We may have a lot of uh, interesting places in uh, Myanmar, so let more Indians visit to Myanmar and more Myanmar visitors uh, come to India. I think I must uh, uh, end here and more uh, political uh, uh, exchanges. I extend uh, a warm invitation on behalf of my party BJP and on behalf of the uh, president of my BJP uh, to come to our headquarters, uh, party headquarters in Delhi, anytime, this time or next time, and we'll be very happy to have a political dialogue with your young political leaders, with our young political leaders, and with your polit uh, party leaders, and with our party leaders. Let a uh, new beginning be uh, done, and thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Tarun. He's also given us a lot of hope because, you know, as you know, there are going to be elections in uh, India soon. And we look forward to the BJP manifesto, including all that uh, Tarun has said. Is that a promise, Tarun? Yes. Sir. So, <laughs> so uh, I think we should clap yeah. for that. Yeah. And I'm sure... Myanmar appears be... very high on our yes. radar and we are not suffering from colonial hangover. So Myanmar is going to be, hopefully, the centerpiece of the foreign policy which B, uh, BJP will uh, follow. And I think that's really something which is constructive, which is going to come out of our meeting here. Can I now request the next speaker? Um, should we go by this? Okay. Uh, Dr. Salai, uh, Mr. Salai, as I can. And, you know, there's something which... I really extend him a very warm extra welcome because he is the person who has been pushing the gender issue in Myanmar. So um, we really expect to hear a lot about that from you. Thank you. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I'd like to express my hearty thanks for bringing me here today and allow me to speak some a uh, very important thing that uh, both countries is encountering. Actually, I still remember this compound that I was in this compound last year, in Aderu. And this is the second time in this compound. The first, first time last year, I was uh, just a participant of, of, of a conference, joint conference. And this time, uh, as, as a speaker, so this is this, this a really challenging moment for, for me. Actually, this is the second visit to New Delhi, and the, the, the same place, and both times. So actually, India is not a strange uh, country for us. We uh, as uh, people living in Myanmar, we have uh, share lots of we share lots of common uh, history, religions, culture, and still now we are still uh, trying to connect each other in terms of 
many ways. However, I still feel that our country is looking more towards East Asia, Southeast Asia, instead of the East, but South Asia. For example, we are a member of ASEAN, but we are just still in the observ observer status in South. For many times, as a person, uh, uh, as a citizen of Myanmar, uh, I, I personally feel that we as, no? uh, you know, our face is more, no? we are looking at the Southeast Asia part, but we are just sort of, you know, giving our back to South Asia. So sometimes I feel like that. So actually not. So now, uh, we also have to you know, look, turn our face again to the India and the South Asia. Because we are now very important situation for both countries. So with that concept, I'd like to share about the overview of the present political scenario in Myanmar and peace process with ethnic armed groups. Uh, yes, I'm from civil society, but I will talk about politics and peace process because it is unavoidable for us as a civil society person to engage in the political transition and peace process in our country. Though we, I'm not a politi politician, but as a civil society person, it is my responsibility in, to engage in political transition and especially in peace building in our country. So Myanmar transition and glance. No? Actually, Myanmar transition, this is very important period for us with three key areas. The first is democratization. You will, you will hear about the release of political prisoners and Dong San Suu Kyi and NLD in parliament. But quick remark is that political prisoners is no, still increasing in number. So actually it's really a, a challenging thing for us is zero political prisoner is sometimes impossible due to some, you know, uh, very strange administration of the, the Uthain Singh government. Yes, somehow, you know, it's a funny thing that we still have heavy political prisoners. Though you might hear, you might heard that, yes, no political prisoners in Myanmar prison. But there's not realistic in, in reality. Economic development, actually there is a second area that uh, political transition, the current transition is, is tackled. And the last one is peace process. That is reconciliation and addressing long neglected needs of the people and ethnic groups. Yes, we are still the golden land. We are still religious state, but it is very true that we still are facing this very challenging moment. And just a glance to understand the conflict in Myanmar, so that you know no, why the, 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 the peace process with ethnic co groups is important. You will see this picture, this is Myanmar, and you will see color. The red color is Kachin State, that is fighting happening at the moment. And other, other colors, there is a ceasefire area. So personally, sometimes I reflect myself that I never know before that we have with civil war. Because throughout the military regime, no, we were taught in school that Myanmar is a very peaceful country and we do not have any conflict in our country. No? And civil war is out of the question. But now you see the map, no? this conflict map of Myanmar, that you will see that we have pile of conflict, armed conflict in our country. Yes, we have uh, eight major ethnic groups, 
Pema majority. Kachin, Kachin, Kea, Kain, Mon, Rakai, and Shan are minorities. Not only the terminology Bama, Yanma, you can also see that Kaya, Kareni, Kain, Karen, Rakai, Arkanis. So this is also no, very good to learn the nomenclature of our no, names in our country. So this is the reflection that 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 the group of people is influencing the the the, the try to mainstream the the uh, the other group to exclude from the the equality and justice. So this is worthy to mention here that as I Haitian born mentioned about the. Uh, conflict in our country. So uh, I quoted from the Asahi Shinbon in 2012 that is still relevant for us. About a third of Myanmar's 60 million people belong to ethnic minorities and many of them resent what they see as domination by the majority of Burman community. But it's very important to, uh, to understand the context that Burman, Burman or Burmese or Burma is not a problem. The problem is the system. The system that produce one group of people to uh, be the instrument for discrimination and violence. So actually, uh, being a Burma is not a problem, but under the militarization of the state, the militarization, the system, it produce a group of people to be uh, a, 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 a weapon for domination and and, and, and a group of people to be, you know, uh, to, to, to suffer, you know, or to be excluded from, from, from the equality and justice. So that's even very important that now we realize that now uh, uh, we are fighting to remove the unjust system, political system that divide us and make a group of people uh, a mainstream, make a group of people uh, uh, seen as as, uh, as an oppressor. So you can imagine that the system, the military system, the militarization, it st started since 1962. It produced this country and the people to suffer, to victimize, you know, not only at the minorities, not ethnic groups, but also Burma suffering from this, you know, uh, political system. So actually, this three-phase peace process that the President Pensei, uh, uh call. So it has three uh, level, state level. Uh, it has five terms. Both sides agree to ceasefire. Deploy troops only agree area, prohibit carrying arms outside agree area, open lines and offices, form an offshore delegation team, and uh, union level it has eight points, forever remain in the union, accept the three national courses, or cooperate in economic development, cooperate in the elimination of negative drugs, set up political parties, accept two thousand eight constitution, fully enter into the leg legal fall for permanent peace to coordinate the existence of only a single armed forces in accordance with the Constitution. And the third is political dialogue or panlong type of conference. And these are three phases of the peace process. The first phase, state level, and the second phase, union level, already, uh, 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 yes, state level already done, and union level is still in process, and the, the, the third phase is waiting. But more and more uh, complication and, 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 and challenges is really with political dialogue. So just for your information, so how many ethnic groups and is fighting against the central government? So we, we, you, uh, I already mentioned that we have eight ethnic, major ethnic groups. No? And out of eight, the seven, taking arms to fight against the, the, the one yeah, since the independence of the country. Here you see ethnic armed groups. Yeah. 
Sorry, na I just mentioned about the the abbreviation. Na uh, action number one is what United Wat State Army, one of the uh, strongest armed group in our country. Uh, stage is uh, in, in, in state state level and, and, and union level. So meetings, how many times they already met? No? This is as of uh, June 30, 30th. NEA, that is the uh, armed group in Shan State. DKB Korean. And RCSS, there is Shan. And CNF, Chin National Front. No? Uh, the the, the they are in the indo border, KNU, Korean, SSPP is also Shan, and MSP, Newmont, Newmont State Party, this is Mon, KN, KNU, KN, KNLA, uh, uh, Korean, KNPP, this is Kaya, Korean, ELP, Arakan, Orakine, NSCA, National Socialist Council Nagaland and PNLO, this is PO, UNFC, UNFC, United National Federal Council, this is a combination of Vietnam groups, Arkan Army and EBSDF, Old Bama Student Democratic Front, and KIO, there's uh, fighting currently going on. Uh, as of uh, June 30th, they already met for 13 times, but they are not able to settle the dis dispute between two parties, and TNLA, Ta'ang National Liberation Army. So, uh, you know, at the moment we have 18 groups who are entering peace process with uh, with union government. So you will see what we, na, we are rich enough in our country, na, apart from economic development, is conflict. This is just I mentioned about the armed conflict. We have other conflict because of the resource sharing and, 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 and economic investment by the, the, the neighboring countries. Uh, Nissan Dam conflict, that, that, that is the, the you know, uh, conflict because of the economic investment. Nissan Dam, the way, Nissan no? Dam by Chinese uh, government, China from China, and the way by Thai, and the letdown from China and you know, unfortunately, Kaladan also no, is also one of them. Yeah. Yeah. So issues and challenges. So actually, the issues uh, around the peace process is that the issue of trust, confidence building. Actually, uh, the the trust building is very very important for us, but mistrust has become a part of the peace culture in Myanmar. Actually, uh, uh, yes, the ethnic armed groups are entering into the peace process with union government, but the, 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 the big challenge for them and all of us is the trust. Very difficult to put up whole trust on uh, the, the union government. And at the same time, you, we also observe that union government is also struggling to put whole trust against the, the, the ethnic armed groups. Yes, we are, you, we are having meetings, we are having ceasefire uh, talks, peace talks, but still, you know, mistrust between two groups is still embedded. The second issue is uh, this, this, this part is care leaders, and this part uh, the talk between uh, union government and KNU. So uh, the second very important issue is two different interpretation. What the government interpret about the current peace process is not the same sometimes with what ethnic armed groups expect. For example, no? uh, uh, when the ethnic armed groups talk about the peace process, it's the future of the union. But for the union government, that is talking about the the how the na an armed group an in, an insurgent to become uh, a legal force. No? So that is very 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 uh, uh, challenging for us. For example, uh, another very important the discussion in the talks is that when the the 
uh, the ethnic armed group talk about the armed forces, armed wing. For example, as a member of, you know, uh, I'm also invited in the peace talk with Chia National Front and Union government. In one discussion, it's very, very important. When CNF mentioned about the, 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 the military issues, what the government answer, the government delegation answer is this only, you know, uh, uh, how CNA, Chia National Army, to become uh, a legal person, no? how, to, no? how to reintegrate in the society. But what CNA mentioned about it, the future of the Tamando, that is the Union military, Union Army. So actually this kind of, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, different interpretation on the process is very challenging for us. So, yes, we still have uh, challenges, issues, but at the same time we are looking at the Indian role. What Indian can play in this current uh, political uh, scenario and peace process? Yes, we are going through uh, a long process of uh, ethnic conflict. Now everything is uh, opening, and now we realize that the, the we need things, so much things to do. And in, in that situation, what India can play? First, look at policy and peace and reconciliation in Myanmar. How how much you can be safe no? in terms of your security, in, in terms of implementing Loki's policy if Myanmar is not peaceful, especially CNF and ELP is, you know, is, is, is acting in your border. The second, democratic federalism. Actually now Myanmar is say, on the way for uh, 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 constitutional reform, constitutional amendment, Everybody talking about federalism. How India can, you know, y how you manage the federalism, democratic federalism in India, this will be a, a, a good thing. Lastly, but not the least, is transparent investment, a good practice in India. As uh, Chairman uh, Zosa mentioned earlier, that we do not want India to be second China because, we, because you are a democratic country. So we really want to learn the good practice of you know, person like the right to information, something like that. Because the whole country, we have lots of, uh, you know, full pile of economic investment, but very least transparency. So this is what the people, you know, now by exercising our democratic rights, our human rights, this is demanding every, every day. Thank you very much, you know. Uh, uh, it is still dawn, but at least we are hoping that the day will come soon. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. And you didn't. Uh, we still have uh, time, so I would really request um, a journalist colleague from uh, Myanmar, and uh, she has been associated with journalism in her country for the last three years. And uh, Ms. E. E. Tuen Luen, I hope I've pronounced your name <laughs> properly, um, has been covering uh, not only the political developments in her country, but also the ethnic problems and environment. And she tells me that unlike India, being a journalist and a woman journalist in Myanmar is not a problem at all. After this, we also have some of our very eminent Indian journalists among, amongst us, and I would request them to please take part in this discussion on the role of the media. And uh, the, after, the, after my friend has spoken, will you, will you come here? Or would you want to speak from, do you have a, a power presentation? I think your power presentation in about five minutes, three minutes. Yeah, can you make it? This? Don't make it 10 minutes, we also need to please. Can you cut it short, please? Thank you. Yes, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. And I'm E. Dolan, a senior reporter of the Myanmar Thai. I'm very happy um, coming here. Um, now I'm sharing uh, my experience and what is the changes and happening in Myanmar, especially about the media role. So.
as you know, uh, the, the me civilian government uh, took power in 2011. There have been um, brought some changes um, to media environment. Um, changes the press security policy step by step, but um, some expression were revoked. Um, we have more um, getting chance uh, for publishing a story, um, but um, we have some limited in publishing some state issue. Those government issue um, can hand their business if that is a problem, um, especially a mega project. Uh, those were made to contract with foreign companies, uh, mostly invested in China. Um, as you know, there have been uh, most, um, mostly famous problems, uh, level down project um, by Chinese company invested in Myanmar. So, and Another one is significant changes. Um, after almost 15 years, uh, Myanmar government abolished uh, publication and pre-publication censorship of news uh, publication on August 2010. Um, all publication within the country have been exempt from being scrutinized before publication by the PSB. Um, but um, some Directors and inspiration issue under the 1962 uh, printers and publisher registration law were revoked, uh, but um, some directors and inspiration remained. Um, but an, all news can be published more freely and people get true information what really happened around the nation. So, um, but we are still uh, facing cha challenges um, beyond the censorship. Um, journalists are more worried about the possibility of facing legal action, particularly uh, when writing about um, government ministry and department. Um, as we expect, um, very soon after leaving pre-censorship, um, some journalists face um, uh, legal action, um, especially uh, well-known weekly newspaper The Vice uh, face um, uh, legal action uh, because of uh, the publish about the correction of the Ministry of Mines. <coughs> um, because of this action, journalists made protest campaign in August 2012 uh, calling for media freedom. After the government changes, um, Ministry of Information allowed publication of private daily newspapers on April 1st, uh, 2013. More than 13 have been granted licensing and 12 are being distributed, including the union daily belonging to the USDP, this is a majority party. Um, dozen uh, private daily newspapers are struggling with a host of problems. Um, cost of circulation is very high, and another problem is transportation problem because uh, they cannot distribute in time to arrive in the some areas. Um, there is a um, current controversial debate between uh, parliament and media organization. The gender has gone bad. Some law and other draconian legislation still remained. Um, Attempt to revenge some uh, stirring debate and how far it will lose and touch state controls. Um, a new bill on printing and publishing enterprise law already passed by Parliament in July 2013. Most journalists um, hated and rejected because the revised law differed little from the original one introduced in 1962. Why media organization against the new law? Because uh, the bill is uh, drafted by MOI. Um, can you find the media be written by the press council on the ground? Uh, most of the amendment agree between the military and press council were not made when the bill was approved. On bill designed, um, most of the generally criticized bill designed to control press freedom. Um, the most uh, debatable part of the draft B are the five restrictions um, once against the publishing on issue concerning incitement of racial and religious hearted 
education to damage law and order, fueling riots and something like this. You can see. Um, so, uh, another point is that the requirement for all online news and print media to register for a license for with the Ministry of Information, which have have the right to delay or revoke licensing. So this is a veteran journalist, Winton. He is a famous and well-known journalist, and he is uh, also a member of the advisory committees of NND. So there, and there are three main major organizations in Myanmar, um, Myanmar Journalist Organization, MTE, um, Myanmar Press Council, um, Myanmar Journalist Network, and Myanmar Journalist Union, MTU. Um, they strongly with us and be and um, they have called to meet with president to discuss an amended draft and some two letters showing uh, about their desire to the representatives committee and president office um, moreover they collect signature uh, by wearing a uh, colorful t-shirt printing give the right to media freedom so that uh, the public can access true information to put forward the public opinion to the president and members of the parliament. Um, Interim Press Council met with the Don San Suji and Parliament Speaker U Shui even met with President U Deng Singh and discussed for amendment B before approve it to law by the parliament. We assume that the parliament will discuss the laws in the coming um, parliament discussion in October 2013. To amend the press law in fact, Myanmar that can facilitate the development of the force estate. To build trust relation with Ministry of Information, to revise the some such kind of law including the nineteen sixty two printing um, printers and publisher registration law. Uh, to conduct more training those could promote um, reporting skill including awareness program of code dot contest uh, to be professional journalists. Yeah, this is a protest campaign um, in August 2012. A journalist, uh, journalist. And this also. And this is a collecting petition of the draft bill, yes, a signature. And this is a shop um, for daily newspaper. Thanks for your attention. Thank you so much. Uh, and you know, um, I'm sure some of my journalist colleagues here will be reminded of a bad phase we went through in our country during emergency. But um, I can assure you that we lived through it and came out pretty good after that. And I'm sure press freedom is something which cannot be denied to journalists for too long. And I hope you will succeed. Thank you. Can I now request um, Tarun? Tarun Basu, who is also an eminent journalist, well known in our country. He's also been through this period, and I'm sure he would like to talk about the challenges here. After this, can I please request Mr. Sumit Chakravarti to please join us here? Thank you, Rashmi. Uh, this morning session so far, is to say the least, has been very enlightening for a lot of us. And if nothing else, it has bridged the, our individual perce perception gaps about Myanmar to a considerable extent. And the perception gap to a large extent, I think people who are responsible for perpetuating this perception gap is a in media in both countries. Now we can come to a, I mean, discuss later on why and how's of it, but the perception that we have today, or the or the, the lack of understanding that we have today about Myanmar, is because the lack of information that we have about each other, and the information that we have about each other, or the little information, is many way percolated through, or seen through the outlook and prism of the Western news wires, which our Honorable MP, Mr. Tarun Vijay, so eloquently spoke about. Now, when we are talking about perception, I am reminded of an article that I read some years ago about a very uh, eminent editor and public intellectual, B.G. Varghese, who is speaking about 
this region said that the region shares a lot of things in common. Notable among them are the ignorance and indifference about each other. And media to a lot of extent, and he went to bemoan about that, has been showing a remarkable lack of interest in this, our neighbors, and only focusing on areas of conflict, confrontation, and crisis. Now, the presentations that we all saw, in many ways, when I was looking at them, yes, bits and pieces, we as information people, we as, you know, people who are interested in this region, no. But to a large extent, it has really opened our eyes. And I really appreciate that for, you know, taking time to prepare these presentations and, you know, presenting them before us. Though India is one of the world's largest, most diverse and vibrant media, it is marked to a large extent by a unnatural focus on a few conflict areas, and again, which again, uh, my namesake Tarun, Tarun pointed out, was marked again with overwhelming focus on two neighbors, China and Pakistan, which we do, with whom we don't share the best of relationships. And even that media reporting is also marked by a lot of negative nationalism and unwarranted sensationalism, particularly by the broadcast media. And since Myanmar, we, although we share the largest land border with them, is not marked by conflict, it goes off the media radar. Do we need a war with Myanmar to be bring it onto the front pages? Is this media, all that media is all that is about? This is something we need to introspect about. But before I go into that, I mean, I just occurred to me while uh, you were giving your media presentation, I think, you know, if you want and if you are here for a few more days, you could give this, we could uh, facilitate a larger present, a presentation by you before, uh, you know, a larger body of journalists. I mean, my colleague Rashmi is one of the founder members of the Indian Women's Press Corps. And she could probably organize a presentation for you in the Indian Women's Press Club here. And I'm sure there'll be a lot of interest in that and would, you know, would get a lot more people to not just learn about the conditions of uh, the media operates in Myanmar, but also to learn more about Myanmar and exchange information with people like you. I'm sure that can be arranged and that can be discussed later on. You know, we have in India, at least some of us, have taken a lot of interest in the democratic changes in Myanmar, including the easing of restrictions by the, in the media. The essence of democracy, as we know, are the guarantee of personal freedoms. We in India often have been taking that for granted. But, you know, the expression of the freedom is often seen through the expression of the, the you know, availability of a broad cross-section of opinions, information, and cross-current of ideas that flow into our minds and homes. You know, in media in India, in a lot of ways, is omnipresent. It influences government thinking, government policies, political thinking, social mores, cultural lifestyles. And we cannot escape the, I mean, nobody in India can escape the influence of the media to a large extent. But that media needs to be, in my mind, not, it may not be, in the, you know, everybody may not think that way, to be harnessed in a more productive way to be able to, in some ways, network at least our region in getting to know more about each other. Various proposals have been mooted over the last years, decades, etc., of forming a South Asian media group or forming a regional media group, forming bilateral media forums, editors' forums. But nothing much has happened in that respect. You know, these have been aired, these have been uh, discussed over these uh, conferences, and there is where it, those proposals have died. I wish in after forums like this, we are able to come down and come down to, well, bullet points of finally what we think that should be take away from these conferences and how we can act on them. And I think 
one of the fundamental ways to bridge the understanding gap, the consciousness gap, the perception gap about each other is through the medium of media. And media can play a big way in, at least the Indian media can play a big way in collaborating, cooperating, holding hands with the mind minds media in through various platforms that it operates on today and see what can be done. I mean, I, you know, yesterday when I was having, um, you know, we were, uh, last night when we were discussing a few things, when uh, the Honorable MP Puzam, he was talking about the politics of Myanmar. See, we in India, Myanmar, even when we looked at the democratic changes in Myanmar, we largely saw it through the prism of Osa Suu Kyi, a very charismatic and iconic figure who's a hero to Myanmar's people and who is highly regarded in India. And the, she has, in many ways, been the, epitomized the democratic changes in Myanmar. But what I didn't know, and many of us didn't know, that while the NLD's role is very, very important, there is a 16-member alliance or coalition of political parties headed by... And? Yeah which has also been building up in Myanmar and which plays an equally major role. Now, this is something that we have not much read about other than those who have taken a lot of deep interest in Myanmar who have a background of dealing with Myanmar. Now, I wonder in what, see, there is, in a sense, Indian media is largely private and in a many ways the economic downturn has affected the working of the Indian media. It is not possible for people to suddenly keep station correspondence in Myanmar. We don't even have half a dozen correspondents in China. While China has about 20 or 22 correspondents here, India has the last count, I was told, I mean, it, India, China, four of them, just four. Because if India cannot, media cannot afford to have correspondents in China, I don't see how it can afford correspondence in Myanmar. Sir, but, allow me. Yeah. Uh, I would like uh, uh, to change, uh, you to change the word, cannot afford. They afford. They are the billionaires, the Indian media houses have no dearth of money, but there is no willingness. They diversify their money, which they earn through journalism to other uh, Ghana factory, sugar factory, <laughs> schools, and all those. Tarun, I, I mean, in some ways I agree with you, but that's another debate, subject of another debate, and we'll indulge in that one day. <laughs> but the fact remains, you know, in today's internet age, you don't need exactly to post uh, journalists there. We can start exchanging information straight away. And I run a news agency. We'd be very happy straight away to ex start exchanging information from tomorrow, whichever media is interested in. And there is may not be a necessarily a commercial element involved in that. And when I say take away, we can start it straight away and let's do it. And we can talk about it individually later on. But that exchange of information is a must. I mean, I gave you some figures yesterday. The Indian media is probably one of the most largest in the world in terms of the sheer numbers. There are 90,000 newspapers and magazines today registered. There are over 800 TV channels. 50% of them are news channels, or at least qualify as news channels. There are hundreds of news websites. There are at the present about 200 odd radio stations, but in the next round of auctions, there will be 800 more coming. So there will be a thousand all radio stations, including FM news, and plus mobile phones. That is today a major platform of news and information. And India, as you know, is the second largest mobile uh, network in the world after China. There are about 900 million mobile phones. Over 50% of them are smartphones, which can take multimedia in news and information. So look at the amount of media that we are sitting on, literally. But we are not using it to know more about our, each other and our neighbors. Now, it was very gratifying to hear from your, I mean, uh, know from your presentation about the relaxing of curbs on Myanmar media and that about, I think, 16 to 20 newspapers, private papers, are today allowed to operate as a daily newspaper, which it was not allowed earlier. And uh, that almost, I think, how many of them have already started operating? 16, not 20. 
12 of them have started operating already. So one can always start some kind of an information exchange with any of them. Or I don't know if you have a news agency today. Earlier you had the Mizima news agency, which then became an exiled news agency. And they also, in fact, at one point was a major source of information in news for people in India who, was, who wanted to know what is happening behind the so-called Iron Curtain in Myanmar. I don't know whether they are still in operation now. They can be another very good source of information and knowledge which can bridge through the sometimes the distorted imagery and distorted projection done by the Western news agencies. Why do we have to know about each other through a third party? Why do we have to know about each other through the perception of London or Paris or Washington? If distances are not so large, that perception gap that we have between us can be easily bridged if we want to. And today, internet and modern technology are the perfect vehicle for us to bridge that information gap. We just have to reach out to each other. So I would, I mean, I will end with these submissions and we can then continue our discussion later on. And I'm sure my colleagues, Sumit Chakravarti here and Munish Gupta have a lot more to share with you on the subject. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Tarun. And I'm sure we'll follow up on these ideas. I hope something will really come out of this. Uh, meeting. Can I please uh, call upon Mr. Chakravarti, who's a very eminent journalist and well read as far as the audience is concerned? Thank you. Thank you, Rashmi. <laughs> you really flattered me. That's not the case. But uh, before I say something, let me first remember someone who had played a leading role in very difficult days of Burma, I want to use the term Burma, not Myanmar, for obvious reasons. That is, she was a member of parliament, Nirmala Deshpande. She had played a very leading role in trying to mobilize Indian parliamentarians in defense of democracy in Burma. When, for reasons of expediency or real politic, the government of India had taken a role which was not explicitly supportive of the democratic movement in Burma. Now, after what Tarun has told you about the media scene here, I don't want to dilate on that. But I would like to flag a few points. For example, the kind of movement which you have launched following the lifting of curbs on the media. I mean, I would like to mention here that as far as India is concerned, it was not just during the emergency period of 19 months of emergency when we lost, in a way, freedom to express ourselves due to pre-censorship and other forms of restriction. But even, other, uh, even in, uh, on, uh, at other points of time, we had, in different parts of the country, been subjected to restrictions. Of course, the media practitioners here, they came out on the streets against the Bihar Press Bill or the defamation law. And we were able to resist those attempts to curb media freedom. So what you are doing today, I mean, it is very much reminiscent of what we had done in the past. So there is an element of solidarity between us. 18 years ago, some 18 years ago in 1995, we had an international convention here in support of democracy in Burma. It was organized by George Fernandez and I happened to be there. And at that conference, at that convention, I had raised one point, which is that we should try to highlight the importance of free flow of information, which is not there when it comes to Burma. So I was asked, you mean to say we would petition the military rulers? I said, no. It's not a question of petitioning. We demand that. It is our inherent right to get free flow, 
free information. And finally, that was incorporated in the document. Now, I was just thinking, listening to all the speeches here, how the world has changed. This was 18 years ago, when we could never imagine that there would be such stupendous changes in Burma. In fact, I can share with you just, I am digressing a bit. What I want to highlight is that there is enormous gap in knowing what is going on in our neighboring country. We had gone to China, a delegation, and an Indian expert on China, specialist on China, asked members of the Chinese Institute of Strategic Studies in Shanghai, what is going on in Burma? Can you tell us? Because you have close connections with Burma. So can you tell us? And as you know, the Chinese are highly inscrutable. They remain silent. And it was left to the leader of the Indian delegation, a former director of the this particular center, and an ex IFS officer who came out with all the details of what was going on. So this gentleman sitting beside me, the Indian expert on China, asked him, how do you know so much on Burma? So I had to tell him that because he is one of the few persons in India who happens to be the authority on Burma. Now, this is the kind of ignorance which we had faced because there was no free flow of information. Today the world has changed. Today we are able to know what is going on in Burma to a large extent. And I was very gratified to find uh, the details which you gave about the problems which you are facing with regard to the ethnic nationalities. Because of my, uh, my interest in Burma, and I have been part of the solidarity movement in Burma, I have also come to know certain things. But uh, here, I would like to know one point and which is different from the insurgent movements which are going on in different parts of the country, particularly in the Northeast, and the insurgent movements in Burma. After all, the ethnic nationalities in Burma are not wanting secession from Burma, which is a point of, major point of difference with India, because most of the ethnic nationalities here, especially in the Northeast, who are fighting the central government, they are demanding separation or secession from India. So what your ethnic nationalities are demanding is federalism. And we sincerely hope the, ultimately when you have the Panglong Conference, you will be able to resolve that problem, unlike what has happened in another neighboring country of India, which is Sri Lanka, which is really very tragic. I think you will be able to, because of the democratic atmosphere, environment in which you are trying to advance, you will be able to solve that problem. I only hope that there should be more interaction between medieval practitioners of India and Burma. And uh, Tarun mentioned about Mizima News Agency, Mizima Newspaper, and we are also reminded of our friend, young friend, so I mean, who happens to be now a, quite an important person in the media field in Burma. And uh, please convey our best wishes to him. He had suffered a lot when that hijack incident took place several years ago, but that is all past history, and we have to look forward. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Sumit. Uh, can I invite Munish to say a, f a few words? Munish, don't keep us away from lunch for too long. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. First of all, uh, I'm grateful to my friends here, uh, Tarun, Tarun Basu and uh, Uday Baskar, for introducing me to this forum, Society for Policy Studies. And uh, this is the first conference I'm attending, and I'm very pleased to be here. I'm very pleased to be here at this conference that focuses on Myanmar. I'll just give you my perspective on what I've heard since morning and what I do around the world. I live in America. I live between the U.S. and India, and I've seen a lot of movements. I was a child of emergency. My father 
was thrown out of a job as a journalist during the emergency. So I have also seen emergency from a different angle. I decided to become a journalist after going to school in physics, but uh, I have traversed a long journey since. I, I just feel that, uh, as, as I've heard many people say here, that what's important to recognize is that we live in a region so close together that we have to collaborate and cooperate. I don't think that government uh, as such can only be the, the people who can or the instruments of change in a region. People everywhere in the world, I've seen Africa, I've seen Middle East now, the Arab Spring and India itself, that uh, we need to work as a result of this conference. We need to work to enhance people-to-people -people connectivity. And I'm very happy to see that this conference itself has become a platform where we are engaging with the politicians, with the NGOs, with the media, between the two countries, and hopefully expanding the scope. I also represent the Indian diaspora, and I can tell you that with the government of India two years ago, we emphasized that there are people of Indian origin living in Myanmar who need to be brought here and connected to India, and children have started coming for the last two years. And, and from what I have seen around the world in many countries, I can assure you, that the Indian diaspora in those countries are also important harbingers of change. Uh, you talked about action, you know, one of these, uh, my companies, PIOTV, of course, we love to cover this conference, but my sister also owns uh, a private television channel in the Northeast, so I want to assure you that what is covered here today will be carried on a major television channel in Northeast India, and having seen Northeast India, I agree with the sum and substance of this con uh, conference that we have to expand and enhance the connectivity between Myanmar and the states and the people of the Northeast. Even the government of India will have to use that connectivity to make that a reality for, uh, for ASEAN and for the Look East policy. Lastly, uh, I would like to emphasize what uh, my senior colleagues here have said, that uh, we all have experience in media, diverse background in media, and we would love to encourage any sort of further interaction and exchanges between the media in, that con in your country and ours here and through the rest of the world. And I think that can lead to a major change in the perception of people here in India and the rest of the world, as well as lead to more changes in Myanmar. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed this conference. Thank you so much, Munish. Uh, Ambassador Malik uh, wants to take up something which you have uh, just mentioned. And that's it. And then, thank you, everybody. We will move for lunch after that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, no, I just wanted to clarify one point. You know, the relationship between India and Myanmar, or Burma, as you have put it, um, went through some rather difficult period. And that difficult period specifically was from 1988 to 1992, during which period uh, the government of India, the parliament of India, all stood in, in, a, in a sense in an open support for the democratic uh, process, the elections that had taken place in 1990, and the de desire on our part that the authorities who had conducted that election in, in a free and fair manner would implement the results of the election. I went there in 1990, and that was one of the first points I had to make when I presented my credentials. So it's not that we, we were not in open support. For a period of time, we were. The problem that we faced was that even when I called on the leadership of the NLD which was out of jail and I made it a point of calling on them the moment I had presented my credentials they themselves told us that we understand in terms of your conducting your relations with the country you have to deal with the authorities that are in power now, this is something that I think we have to understand. And it took a period of time between 1988 and 1990, for instance, even letters of credit, all bilateral 
issues like uh, um, training, etc., had all come to a standstill because of the government of India's policy at that time. So I, I, it's not correct to say that we did not support openly. We did. But it did not uh, take much time to establish in our minds that we had to deal with the people who were in authority, who were ruthless, who were at that moment in time not in the least interested in creating any kind of positive framework for uh, the dealing, uh, dealings with their own people. And the other aspect I would like to just mention, uh, I think it's very important. Uh, it's, it's true that the insurgency in Northeast India has secession as, as a motivating factor. But please remember one thing. The first Panglong conference, convention, gave the right to secede to the ethnic minorities, which was reflected not exactly the way in which the convention had established it, but it was reflected in the 1947 constitution. The right to secede after a period of 10 years, if the ethnic uh, groups were not uh, in favor of, uh, they did not see that their interests were being served, they had the right to secede. And the uh, the coup that took place under Navin actually was to address this aspect also. So they did have, they did demand a right to secede and they did have a right to secede. Now you have a situation where the demand is for federalism. That has always been there and autonomy. It's not just plain federalism. And as far as the defense forces are concerned, federalism to, in their mind still remains a door by which the ethnic minorities can secede. This is one of the reasons why their attitude to their constitution making has so far remained one which talks about central authority in every sense of the term being maintained and the integrity and the sovereignty is not as of today even in the hands of the, uh, the civilian or notionally civilian government, it still remains within a very specific dimension which is maintained by the armed forces. So I thought it was necessary to clarify these points because if, to understand our relationship with Myanmar today, we cannot rule out the fact that this transition period may last much longer than people are hoping for. And you have to deal with that. That's part of the dynamic and the challenge that we Thank you. Oh, sorry. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, this brings us to the end of this session. I want to thank all the speakers for not only giving us so much information and so much uh, thought for uh, food for thought, but the fact that we've also come out with a number of things which we can work on and take this whole thing forward. And on behalf of SPS, I'm sure I have the permission of my colleagues to say that we would love to play and we will play a role in trying to take this relationship forward. And um, thank you all for cooperating vis-a-vis -vis the time limit. Thank you. Now back to Uday. Thank you. I just want to thank Rashmi for sharing, I think, a very productive session. Couple of very minor administrative announcements since we have overshot slightly. This is a good sign, you know, if a conference gets off to a start where we need to actually spend more time and we compress the lunch break, I think it's a very good sign. My request is by that watch, if we can come back by 10 past 2, we'll try and cast off at quarter past 2 sharp and we'll have Preet Malik, Ambassador Malik in the chair at that time. So, ladies and gentlemen, many thanks.